It's just a piece of cloth or maybe a similar material, not really a piece of clothing meant to cover parts of the body that should be covered in public, but in fact, it is. In fact, wearing it or not wearing it has become quite a controversy with the two sides clearly defined. One says, you must wear it. The other says, don't. And all kinds of people weigh in, your own family members and friends, your employer, your local government, the media, the governor, the president. And lots of arguments are used to invoke both for and against wearing it, ranging, ranging from law to love, from science to religion, from rights to responsibilities and everything in between. Even it's a conversation within the church and with both sides invoking the name of Jesus and the word of God and telling you that either you should or should not wear the mask. No matter what side you're on, you can't help but have an opinion about it. And more importantly, you have an opinion about the other people, the ones that don't agree with your point of view on the mask. And in a matter of speaking, all of us are judged and we judge others by and for having the mask on or not having it on. Now, those opinions might be positive or negative, might be for or against it, because, and that's, I'm not going to talk about that. That's not the point. The point is that we do make conclusions and judge others based on something external, even something as small as a piece of cloth that they wear. We decide who is good and who is bad, who is right or who is wrong. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, instructs us St. James in our New Testament reading for today. Then he goes on to describe how some in the church or a lot of them judged others based on something external, like a gold ring and fine clothing versus shabby clothing, making decisions about the other people, about their value and their values, and even about their importance, and even about their faith, favoring one over the other, welcoming one and rejecting the other. Yes, the object here, wearing nice clothes, versus not wearing, wearing them. It's different from wearing masks or not wearing them, but the subject, the foundation, the core is the same. It's the human attitude of judging others based on the externals. Same as in Jesus' days. Over the last couple of weeks, we've been looking in the gospel readings and uh, we see Jesus and his disciples facing criticism from the good people, the right people, the, the ones at least they think that they're right, the, the Pharisees, the scribes, the teachers of the law, and they're looking at the externals when it comes to the disciples of Christ. In fact, their criticism is a little bit more in tune to our mask situation today as it deals with the similar matters at least in part when it comes to personal and community hygiene. In fact, in one of our texts, uh, they're accused of not being clean because uh, they don't wash their hands and uh, they don't uh, uh, wash properly their cups and vessels that they use. And then they eat the unclean foods. And Jesus is asked, how can you welcome such people? 
It's because the religious people in Jesus' day made sure that only the right, the proper people, the ones who looked good, the ones who sounded good and did good and wore the proper things, they're the ones whom they welcomed. They rejected the bad, the sinful, the ugly, and especially the ones who did not comply with their rules and mandates. More than that, it really irked them when Jesus welcomed all them, all those people. Matthew 9, And as Jesus reclined at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. He came for the sick, the rejects, the unwelcomed, the hated, treacherous tax collectors, the sinful women who sold sex to put food on the table, the woman caught in the act of adultery, those with horrific skin diseases, the demon possessed, the woman whose internal bleeding made her unclean and untouchable, the Samaritan woman who has had, has had five husbands and was living with a man that wasn't her husband, and especially the hated Gentiles. Indeed, Jesus says, he did not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. Luke 6, 32 he invites the weary and heavy laden to him for rest, Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28. And Jesus welcomes all kinds of wrong people. And overall, as you read through the Gospels, Jesus appears to be a magnet for all the wrong people. And the good people of the day, it's like when you flip the magnet the other way, they just push away from him. They bounce off, and that's their own doing. And instead, gathered around Jesus are the people with skeletons in their closets. They flock to him because what he is saying to them, what he is doing with them, they've never heard that. They've never seen it before. They never even dreamed, uh, dreamed of it. A God who has no qualms about touching a man who is unclean with skin diseases that can't communicate those diseases, a God, a Savior, who is happy to have a prostitute weep at his feet and dry them with her hair. A friend who will share a meal with the most infamous folks in the community. His was a scandalous reputation as Jesus reflects himself in Matthew eleven nineteen. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. That who, that's who he was, Jesus, friend of sinners. And the early church spreads this scandalous message that God is a friend of sinners. And the world, the sinners cannot get enough of it. At the Pentecost, Peter addresses the crowd, his fellow Jews, with a powerful sermon that can be summarized like this. Jesus is the Son of God. He is the Messiah who was sent to you, and you, sinners, killed him. And the Jews are scared. They know it's eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. What should we do, they say? Here's a dramatic exchange at the end of Peter's message, Acts 2. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, Jesus didn't rise from the dead so he can work vengeance and avenge his death. He is risen to forgive. He is there to give them a gift. Even the very people who killed him, he loves them. He gives them a gift of forgiveness and eternal life and the Holy Spirit because he is a friend of sinners, even the ones who killed him. 
but, and soon the ultimate rejects, the ones that uh, should not even belong there, all the Gentiles hear the same message and becomes the mission of St. Paul to proclaim to all that in Christ Jesus, all who believe are children of God. Galatians 3, 28, 29 says, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. And this message is just too scandalous to the religious, to the good people of the day. How can you not mandate that those people will do what we have to do? And so we see in the book of Acts and the epistles, the constant struggle between the disciples who proclaim the gospel of Christ's love for all and those who try to shut them up by imprisoning them, forbidding them from speaking about Christ, driving them out of town, stoning them, and even killing them. And the notion that God only welcomes the right people begins to creep into the church as well. In the same letter to the Galatians, we see an influential group of Jews headed by St. Peter himself looking down at the Gentiles because the Gentiles will not comply to the mandates of the law. And uh, so there, there's got to be second-class citizens, not fellow citizens in the kingdom of God. Because why? Because they're not circumcised, because they don't clean themselves properly and follow all the dietary and hygiene laws. In the book of Acts, we find the Jews neglecting the Gentiles and their widows in the daily food distribution. In Corinth, the church makes a mockery of the Lord's Supper. The important people, the rich people, the influential people go ahead of the other ones, the poor, and not as important, and they actually get drunk, and they overconsume the bread and the wine, making a mockery of the Lord's Supper. And then there's our epistle text for today, where St. James condemns those who welcome the rich and the influential, but humiliate and judge the poor. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. The church that Jesus founded shows no partiality. Jesus still welcomes, pardons, cleanses, and relieves everyone who comes to him, not because they're good enough, but because his promise they believe. There's no list on the front door that spells out the requirements and mandates for entrance. All are welcome, no matter what race, gender, income, marital status, skeletons in the closet, mental condition, political affiliation, you name it, everyone, including those who cannot stand them, is welcome. And this, Jesus proclaims the same message to you. Repent and believe in the gospel. Leave behind a life of a lie, the life in which you pretend to know better, in which you judge other people, because that's when you become your own God. You establish your own truths, and you earn your way to heaven. You and I are lost. You and I are unclean. There's no hope for you inside of you. There's no hope for me inside of me. But there's abundance of hope in someone else. There's cleansing and forgiveness and peace and wholeness in the one who bleeds and dies for you. He will not turn you away because he will not turn anybody away. How could he? He died for them, one and all, including you and me. His grace heals all wounds. His love welcomes all sinners, sinners just as I am, because he is the friend of sinners. Amen.